cool word. Put it down here. Uh, my name's Eric Hardy, and this is George Winston III. And we are here to interview Mr. Russell Henderson, a friend and confidant of Mayor Ernest Dutch Morial, the subject of the Midlow Center Oral History Project. And we're here today to talk to him about his experiences with uh, Mr. Morial. And I guess we'd want to start with sort of the genesis of it all. How did you meet him, and um, what was the nature of your relationship? Well, I, uh, I was born in Baton Rouge. And, uh, should I look at the camera, or should I look at you guys? Or? No, just look at them, it's fine. And, and grew up in Prairieville, Louisiana. And so basically, I'm a country boy. Mm -hmm. And I uh, was at LSU and in 1967. Uh, 1968, when he was sworn in at the legislature, I found out that was going on, and I went down there to see him because uh, I, my life had been threatened by the Klan, and I was involved in civil rights stuff uh, when I was at LSU, and I wanted to see somebody who was thought like I did and and was successful at what they were doing, and. Uh, uh, I knew very little about him, uh, but you know, being the first African American elected to the legislature, you had to have something going for him, and uh, uh, he had to be a courageous person. And at that point, I was kind of looking for role models, or uh, you know, anybody that uh, in this this environment, which Louisiana was a, a very hostile environment for uh, for justice and. Mm -hmm. So that that was my first uh, uh, encounter. I was I was sitting up in the in the balcony in the, on the house side of the state capitol, and, and I was looking down, <coughs> and it was uh, it, it was like a beetle. I, I'd never seen a um, what do you call it a media swarm or whatever they call it, and he was like moving around. And the cameras were all moving with him, uh, and uh, I was, yeah, you know, struck by how light, light skin he was, uh, and uh, and I'd really never seen him before. You know, I, I I don't even know if I'd seen a picture of him before, uh, but I was following the news, and um, so I decided that that was where I wanted to be that day. And it was a historical moment in the in the, uh, in the state of Louisiana, and, uh, and right after that uh, is when uh, Martin Luther King was assassinated. I think I think the sequence was this was in March of '68. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then Martin Luther King was assassinated in April, mm -hmm. and then Bobby was assassinated in uh, June. So. Uh, I was a senior in college and trying desperately to get up, get away, get away uh, trying to figure out what to do with myself. Uh, and probably, let's see, the, the, the war was going on full, full throttle at that point. We were out of the town of the town offensive. And I was uh, probably anti war stuff, whatever that, whatever, whatever you could call it at LSU, civil rights stuff. And Pretty much isolated, marginalized by the administration at the university. When, uh, uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, and when when Bobby was assassinated, we had a throwdown with the the uh, campus security over the putting the flag at half mast. It was just 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 that horrible. And it, I don't know if it's a lot better now, but uh, uh, that's where I was. The day he was sworn in, I was at the state capitol. So he seemed just like a beacon of light, something you gravitated towards? Right. Now, how did you uh, approach him, and what was his response? Well, I, I, I was just a part of the crowd, you know. Uh, the, the first time I ever really talked to him was, was probably like in 70, 71. I, I, had, I went away uh, to the University of Michigan and got a master's degree. 
came back in 1970 and took a job at Milne Boys Home. And I'm sorry, what, what was that? Milne Boys Home. Okay. And that, that, that took me in and out of juvenile court. And he was a juvenile court judge at that, at that point in 1970. And so we started a relationship, really started a relationship when he was in juvenile court. And I was working with kids from Milne who were pretty delinquent. And when I would go down, if I was in somebody else's court, I'd sneak over and go talk to him. Uh, and uh, and his crier, Mr. Matoya. Have you ever heard of Mr. Matoya? No, no. This is, that was his crier in Juvenile Court. Um, so, you know, we just would start talking about what was going on in, in New Orleans. Uh, I guess we talked about juvenile frequency and stuff. That was that was when we first started speaking to each other. So, um, what was it about the man that uh, made you feel so strongly about him, or made you want to get involved? Um, what was it that made you say, um, "I got to get behind this guy"? Well, I, I you know, I, 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 I was, you know, I, I've kind of maybe changed the words, but I really have to change what I think about what goes on here, and and. Uh, if you look at Adam uh, Fairclough's uh, book, he says that racism is the well was is the organizing principle of policy and polit politics in Louisiana. I changed that to white supremacy is the organizing principle of policy and politics in Louisiana, and I, that's where I was in in uh, in 1968, and that's where I am today. And I saw him as a fighter. I, I saw myself as a as a, as a crusader, and uh, uh, and uh, you know I wanted to change uh, the uh, the world, which is why I went away to University of Michigan. I wanted to become you know to learn more about communities and how they function and how to how to be a leader. Um, and I, my father died when I was fifteen. And I can't, my father was working class, blue collar working class, a white guy, I guess. We don't, we don't know in Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> who's who? Uh, who's what? But he was, uh, 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 you know, I, I know we, we, don't have, we can't really talk about this now, but he had, there's specific events in my life that, that involved my father and racial things and uh, you know I think it was just the way I was raised and uh, uh, in, in a way uh, Dutch has always been kind of my civil rights social justice father figure uh, that my, my father was uh, when I was a child when I was an adolescent uh, my father wasn't the kind of leader he was uh, uh, a, a working class stiff you know, who belonged to the union, but he wasn't a, uh, a leader. And I had a, a grandfather who was a labor organizer in Louisiana, and he was kind of wild and crazy. And uh, uh, you know, I think the organizing piece came from that. And I saw, and I, I saw as the more I got to know Dutch, the more uh, he became. the more he impressed me as an organizer. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your um, first job for Dutch? What, in what capacity did you serve? I had never worked for Dutch Mark. Really? No. Really? No. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I say that because, um, because it's true. He, he did offer me a couple of jobs. But, you know, one, one time he offered me a job and I'd just taken a teaching job at Southern and it just wasn't. It just didn't fit, uh, you know. And our personalities just weren't. I, I wasn't going to be his employee. It just wasn't going to work, you know. Uh, but uh, I did a presidential campaign in 1976 for a guy you probably never heard of, and uh, uh, it, it was a senator named Fred Harris, and he was a populist from Oklahoma running for the, the president. And that was when Jimmy Carter was running. And, you know, kind of my, my political uh, 
decision making at that point in my life, and I haven't really changed that much on that. Was uh, you know I look at the the right and the left, you know from right to left, and I try and go as far as I can, right to the mm -hmm. person that is the most progressive. And Fred Harris was the most progressive guy running for president, and he didn't get very far. I think he kind of lost out in Pennsylvania. He's he's a professor at University of New Mexico at this point. I think his wife ran for for president with. Um, uh, the Green Party, uh, I think the last time, with Donna Harris. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, but anyway, so 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 we we put together a campaign in Louisiana, and and it was the the most uh, progressive left wing radical white people in Louisiana that I could find, mm -hmm. and uh, so. One day we were out, and I think this was a, one of those, those transformational moments for me and for Dutch. One day, one night we were at uh, McAllister Hall at um, at Tulane, and we were passing out leaflets. So the Dutch was involved in this campaign no. for okay. No, mm -mm. we were passing out leaflets, and he comes walking out, and we talk. We talk for 30, 45 minutes. I'm saying, you know, you should run for mayor. And so I'm thinking I'm running for mayor. I don't know what I'm going to run for mayor. But, uh, so but what, what the, what the, the, the people, even though we didn't, we didn't have a snowball's chance of winning this presidential thing, but we put together a, a organization in, across the state, but mainly in the wall as a white progressives. And that became the, the core of his, White progressive piece in the uh, mayor's race. Uh, what was the title of the organization? It, well, we didn't really have just a title. It was the, the, you know, it was people like Bill Rushton. Uh, Bill was the editor of the uh, uh, the Courier, and you know, f and Bill Bill had uh, Bill was gay, and Bill ran for a delegate to the Democratic National convention uh, as a Fred Harris as a as a gay person so he was the first out the box not out the box out the closet gay person to run for anything that we know of in Louisiana uh, so you know we we kind of had uh, uh, a, a, a group that was uh, had bill as as a, uh, a person involved uh, and uh, some other kind of progressive leftist white people involved in some environmental people some union people uh, involved and that kind of became the core of his uh, of Dutch's uh, white organization in the first primary mm -hmm. could you could you name some of the people besides Bill Rushton oh man let me th I, I, you're gonna test me I, at this point I, I uh, you know, I, I, when when we when we got to the to the campaign, um, I mean it was Howard Abrams, but I don't know if Howard was involved in the uh, in the uh, but in you know in the campaign in '76 we we, we just kind of kept going in that direction. We, you know, I, I I had long hair and a beard, and I looked like a hippie, and I wore jeans, and. Uh, uh, Although I was I was working, you know, and I had married and had kids, and you know I wasn't that wasn't that was kind of an image thing. So, but what we put together was people who were white progressives, hippies, you know, anybody out there that we could find that would be willing to to support a black guy running for mayor. Um, you know. Well, maybe if I looked at your list over here, I could find something. Sure. Um, yeah, we can right. catch up on that a little bit later on. Right. The um, So what would you say was the climate, the political climate in New Orleans? I understand you had relocated to New Orleans at this time? But I'm, I moved here in 70. Okay. Yeah. So what was the climate? Uh, Moon Landry was... Moon Landry was, was, was the mayor, and, uh, and I, I had gotten involved in some... some so I, I, you know, I, I, I got involved in, in Ben Johnson's campaign for, for the governor and for the Senate because I, I mean, race was just always the, for me the, 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 um, 
kind of the dividing line. And, and, and Edwards had, had voted against the civil rights stuff, and, and uh, except for when he was away and gambling. And, uh, and plus, he said he wanted to have, he said that we should shoot all the demonstrators in the streets. And I was demonstrating in the street against the war. So I mean, I, I just had no use for Edwards. And uh, so, you know, I got involved in the campaign in 70, uh, 72, with Edwards, against Edwards. And I never did, I only voted for Edwards one time, and that was, you know, with, when he was against Duke. And I regret that. Not that I wish, not that I regret not voting for Duke. I never would have voted for him. But he was a 60 40 victory, and he didn't need my vote at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the black political organizations in the, in the 70s were, were accommodationist. They were there. They were put together to elect white people. Uh, and, you know, I, I had some dealings with, I guess, I guess I had some dealings with people from Seoul, with people from Bold. Uh, you know, when Moon was, was the mayor, and, and my dealings were never very uh, uh, positive. You know, I, 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 Singleton and, and Sherman and I were not on the same page. Um, and kind of, I, I was involved in a lot of healthcare access stuff in the 70s. We had a consumer health organization here. and. We pulled together some of the the, the more uh, the the black activists that were not part of the the power structure in that effort, and we did some um, I lost my train. I was talking about Maybe the health consumer. Uh, yes. Access. Yeah. Uh, but that was all about race. That was about Title VI of the Civil Rights Act uh, and trying to keep, uh, you know, all these hospitals. We had, we had, uh, what the, you know, Brown versus the board was the, was the, the lawsuit about education. Well, Cook versus Ashna was the lawsuit about health care. And that was, I think she filed that suit in 1968 when she tried to get into Ashna, and then she died shortly afterwards. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, Department of Health, and the, the federal HEW, Health Education and Welfare, it was called at that time, uh, issued a letter, letter of finding that six hospitals, Mercy, Baptist, Ashna, uh, East Jeff, West Jeff, and all of these hospitals did harm to the health care of African Americans, and uh, so we were uh, we were involved in this whole civil rights thing with health care in New Orleans. There were no blacks, and there were no black physicians in any of the hospitals. They wouldn't allow uh, uh, black uh, uh, patients or nurses. And, I remember talking to a doctor one time who I knew very well, who was involved with the uh, uh, with Mercy, who said, "You know, the only ends you'll ever see in this hospital will be sleeping, sweeping the floor, and doing bedpans." You know, uh, so that was the, we were doing the, during the whole seventies. Uh, from like 72, 73, we did this whole battle over, over health care in, in the law. It basically ended when Reagan became president because at that point, you know, it was all over. Segregation is fine. Uh, so the health care stuff was going on. Um, I, I, I was also involved in the prison stuff. It was another one of my battles with Edwards, because you know now we have more people incarcerated in Louisiana than any place else in the world, and Edwards was the one that did that. Not that he didn't pass the laws, but he built the prisons, and so we had a um, 
we had an anti-prison, uh, we had a uh, Louisiana moratorium on jails and prisons we had, uh, where we were active at the legislature trying to stop the construction of jails and prisons. And that was, of course, racial, because you know, we were talking about building prisons to lock up white people, we're talking about building prisons to lock up black people, which is where we are today. What, 80, 75, 76 percent of people locked up in, in Louisiana are African American, and you get the females, it's close to 80 percent of people locked up are African American. So, prison stuff, uh, health care stuff. Uh, I was involved in in the, uh, this is kind of a, you know, kind of battles, just some more battles with, I, I ran a drug treatment program in the, for um, heroin addicts in the, in the 70s, so I was involved with the Mayor's Drug Abuse Advisory Council, which was Moon Land, and tangentially with the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and you know, trying to get more services for people uh, in, a, in a less politicized fashion. Uh, and you know, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that was going on there was was patronage, where the the organizations would control. You know, the organizations that supported the mayor would control where the funding went. Uh, so the the, the uh, I'm not sure how I got to be. To, I, you know, I, we were sitting around in a room one day. The basically the people run programs in New Orleans sitting around in a room, and they said, "Well, who's going to be the chair?" And nobody wanted to be the chair, so they picked me. So I got to be the front person on the Drug Abuse Advisory Council, kind of representing the clinics, mainly in their battles with the Land Administration. He uh, the, was the administration reluctant to fund these programs. Uh, I, well, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Reluctant. It, it was a political battle between the the programs and the political people where the decisions were being made. The decisions were being made about funding, not not about not getting funding, but who would get funding, what kinds of things were funded. It was all being made at the political the political organization level. And and the guys running the clinics were like um, you know, I, th I think they, they felt that, that they had the best interests of the clients in mind and, the, and they were running programs to help people and uh, the people upstairs were, running, were trying to, to run the programs to feather their own nest. I see. And so they kind of pushed me out as the front person. Well now, as I knew, Morial was on little, literally on the bench at this time uh, up until, you know, he ran uh, well, the campaign. Well, the Fourth Circuit Court, he was, and, and that's when, when we really started working on the campaign was when he was on the Court of Appeals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'd go visit him in the, in the court room and, and, you know, Dutch, I know this is a cliche, but Dutch was really a, 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 a renaissance man. He was just really well read. He was clearly, the, to me, clearly the most intelligent political person out there, black or white, I mean, it's just not, uh, you know, and when we, when we'd be campaigning, uh, you know, we'd go to an art gallery, you know, are you going to his house, you've been to his house? No. You know, it's, it's like, it's like uh, uh, pictures all over the wall, paintings all over the wall. He was into art, um, and, uh, so he, he was always reading something, and uh, so I don't even remember the name of the book, but he was reading some book about black politics in, in America, and uh, you know, he was like, you know, ripping and reading, saying, you see here, you see here? He says, you know, the political organizations are dead, da, da, da. well, the political organizations were dead, but we needed to figure out a way of getting around the political organizations because they were not going to be with him, because the political organizations were as as Dr. Hirsch, I think, clearly lays it out, accommodations. The, the black political organizations were, were organized to elect white people. And Dutch had formed life when 68, Louisiana Federation mm -hmm. of Electors, 67, 68, or whatever. And 
you know, basically he found life to end up to, to elect Dutch Mario. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> and he, didn't, he didn't find life to elect a black person. You know, unfortunately, I wasn't here in '69 when he ran for council of large. I was away in Ann Arbor. Uh, I'd love to have been part of that. He lost that by 5,000 votes and scared the hell out of the whole white establishment. Um, but that was interesting because it, it presaged um, the, um, his later election, runoff election against DeRosa because he lost the 69 um, councilman at large race to DeRosa mm-hmm. uh, eight years later. Uh, yeah, and, and, and well, I, I really, I, I don't even. Some reason I think there was somebody else in there. Um, Fitzmaurice was in there. I, uh, no, Fitzmaurice was running from there. Like I said, I wasn't here in '69, so mm-hmm. I, I wasn't I wasn't part of it. Uh, but obviously, it 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 helped him to it, it, it honed his, his organizing skills mm-hmm. and helped him to look at to evaluate who's who and what's what and that kind of stuff. So I. Uh, I don't know timing, timing, what came first or whatever, but you know, just go through some of the things we did. I, I set up a series of lunches with him, and uh, we have them. We have these lunches at La Pavillon. It'd be two on one. I, you know, I would set it up. I'd invite somebody, usually some kind of white liberal guy, and uh, uh, and with Dutch, and we have lunch and we talk about, you know, should I run? You know, basically, it already decided, but uh, and. Uh, so we had a whole series of, of lunches with that, and I, and I think, and I think, I don't, I don't know for sure, but I think from that, he kind of reached the point where he, he decided that, you know, liberals were not going to help him. Mm-hmm. You know, he could not depend on the liberal vote. The white liberals were not, you know, and and that's exactly what happened. Um, so um, we we had a series of. We would go through. We tried to do something every day, and I, I wish I had a schedule from the. Do y'all have a schedule from the campaign? From the campaign, uh, just to refresh my memory. We, we tried to do something every every night, because remember he was he was still a judge, mm-hmm. and uh, and so we set up a series of what we call fundraisers, F U N R A I S E R, at different people's houses. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had we had them at. Um, we had at least one at Tipitina's. Um, and, you know, it was mainly just to get him out there talking to people. And when we first started, he was, he was, you know, we'd get in a room, he'd be like, you know, 20 people in the room, he'd be like, he'd want to go stand in the corner because he was smarter than all of them, right? And he, he, he should be the mayor. And he didn't, you know. <laughs> and um, so, um, you know, I had to get him out there and get him shaking hands with people. I'd yeah. make him, I had to make him shake hands with people. And you know, and so we go through the night, and then, and then at the end, I said, "Did you shake hands? Did you talk to everybody in the room?" Yeah, yeah, I talked to everybody. Yeah, yeah, I talked to everybody. Okay. Uh, so he, you know, we we would go uptown, we'd go downtown, uh, we would go uh, in people's rooms, in people's houses, uh, and. Uh, We focused on the, the the smaller, more militant black organization because Sol and Ku and Bow were out the question, and they were all supporting. Uh, one of them was supporting Tony Morrison, as I recall. Another one was supporting. Uh, uh, to, well, Sol. Sol supported Soul, Kiefer. Sol supported yeah. Kiefer, uh, and. Uh, So we, you know, I, I was convinced that we could get into a runoff. I was convinced that we could win. Now, as I recall, the voter registration was 42% African American, yeah. you know, when we started this whole process. And that was kind of something everybody held over our head that we couldn't win. Well, we did a strong voter registration program. In fact, uh, I can't tell you the date, but there was a date when we had. Uh, more people. There was on one day we had more people registered to vote uh, than on any other day in the history of Louisiana. 
So he was targeting on black folks and, and raising the voter registration on black folks and targeting on the, the white uh, uh, progressive radical piece. And he had a, we had a radical black guy running for a uh, uh, oh. mayor at that point, which kind of uh, I don't. I don't think he got any votes, and, and 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 Dutch would say things like, you know, this guy makes more sense than anybody else up there, uh, and he's always right about stuff. But uh, you know, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we you know, we, uh, we look to like Jim Hayes and Ron Chisholm from Tremaine. Do you know who the, those people are? Names are familiar, but not. Uh, they were well. They they were both trained by Saul Alinsky, uh, and they were both community organizers uh, in the in the Treme community, um, and that was the kind of people that we had to depend upon, because you know Dutch, Dutch said you know we have to go over the organ the, the black organizations, and going over them meant either we were going directly to people or we were picking up. Uh, organizations that were smaller that were not part of the accommodation, and like the like like Chisholm and and Hayes were not accommodationist, you know, they they uh, they were um, they were fighting with the with the Landrieu establishment over the destruction of the the uh, Treme neighborhood and uh, the construction of the the uh, the auditorium and not the auditorium the theater form and arts and Armstrong Park. So they, you know, they were already there fighting the establishment. What was Hayes' the first name? Jim Hayes. Jim Hayes. The Ron Chisholm. They were the people's. People's Organization for Survival and Beyond, something like that. They have an organization that they do uh, anti racism stuff nationwide, which is a continuing threat, right? That, that, that you know. I was in it because I was a crusader because I wanted to change the world and race was the was the uh, the, the line that separated everything. Dutch Dutch loved talking about the Times Picayune. Mm -hmm. The Times Pick on you, he called it, <laughs> and and it was very studied. You know, it was very intentional. I mean, not only were they a racist rag, which they they haven't really changed that much. Not only were they a racist rag. But he knew that he could use the Times Picayune if he clobbered, if he kept bashing the Times Picayune, that would help him with black folks. Because mm -hmm. go talk to black folks today, they still think the Times Picayune is a racist rag. Mm -hmm. And so he, you know, he used them as a, as a, uh, as not a straw man, but as a, uh, I don't know what the right word is, but uh, by continuing to bash the Times Picayune, he continued to gain uh, respect in the in the black community, uh, and he, you know, he, he he had he had to deal with the duality of skin color. Okay, being a light skinned black guy, uh, and you know there were lots of dirty tricks in the campaign, uh, and one of them was uh, I think it came out of Kiefer, I'm not sure, uh, where they were saying that that uh, Dutch had. A, Something like that, you know. They were trying to. They they, they were trying to. The Kiefer piece was to go. Part of the Kiefer piece was to try and get the black community away from Dutch because he wasn't really black. Yeah. Um, well, Ke Kiefer, yeah, had or, um, had ties to Seoul, and he was a downtowner, right? So they thought that possibly he could. He was in direct competition. Most direct competition for the black votes. Right, Kiefer was Kiefer was was our biggest opponent, and uh, you know, f for me personally and uh, for Dutch, one of the most disheartening moments. Although we knew it was going to happen, you, you know, sometimes you know things going to happen, but you got to go through the motions anyway. Mm -hmm. Is when we went to the AFL CIO uh, in Baton Rouge, and we met with the um, the the people from. What they call a felt band office too, which was basically the blacks in the labor movement, and you know Dash liked to talk about his grandfather was a his father was a cigar maker and a union guy and stuff like that, and I think Dutch may have even carried a union card sometimes, and, and 
you know, I mean, the, the union should have been with us, mm -hmm. you know, in, in an ideal world, but the unions were racist too. And the, the, the hurtful thing was when, is when we, we knew they weren't going to go with us, but when the, when, the, uh, when the blacks in the union movement didn't go with us, that was hurtful. And again, but that was just something else that, you know, it, it was like, sort of like the black political organizations. They were there, they were going to be on the other side, so therefore we had to go over them, and he had to go directly to the black working class mm -hmm. to get them to come on board uh, think, with him. You think that um, kind of person-to-person -person politics essentially for him, going over the he, organization? He, 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 absolutely. He spent a lot of time on the streets. Mm -hmm. He spent a lot of time walking through the projects. Uh, he... Uh, uh, you know, and these house, these house things that we did a lot, uh, and you know, we'd, we'd be walking through the projects, uh, and you know, like if we did like the 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 Lafitte, uh, the Lafitte project, we'd do it with Chesman Hayes, mm -hmm. you know, who were the street yeah. organizers there in the projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, he, and there were all, there, you know, there, there were people coming up and yelling and screaming. I mean, black people coming up and yelling and screaming at him about this and about that, you know, it, when he was doing it, but, you know, he was just right on. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to be stopped. And, uh, the, um, but, I, you know, on, on a, on a personal level, I think, I think, I, you know, I'm not black, so I don't know, but I think that black folks identified with him and, 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 and the fact that he was a fighter, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that he was taking on this, the white establishment. Uh, and he, uh, and also, also, he, he also was a strategic political person, which you don't see very often today. I mean, people just don't, don't do politics. I mean, he, he knew that in order for him to get into runoff, he needed to have as high a black turnout as possible. So he got all the blacks to run. He wasn't just for, he kept saying, kept telling people, I'm only interested in my race. I'm not interested in any In the meantime, he was making sure he had somebody running over here. Yeah. And I remember one time we had a big thing down in Central City over the assessor. I don't remember how many people were running, but it must have had like eight or nine people running for assessor. It's really Alexander and a bunch of people. And I'm saying, and they wanted him to become referee, I think. They wanted him to pick who it was going to be. And I think in the end, I think he, I think they just all ran. And I think that was his, you know, he wanted them all to run, you know, because the more they ran, the higher the turnout would be. And the more voter registration would, would, would be. Uh, and so, you know, he ran, he ran strategically. Uh, uh, another kind of strategic thing was we had the council at large races, right? And um, Sidney Bartholomew was running, Bob Tucker was running. Mm -hmm. I can't remember who else was running. Jeruso ran for, well, he's running for another spot, yeah. I believe, right? Uh, no, he, I, I don't think he was running at that point. I don't remember that, but you know, he was. Dutch was saying, "Okay, the white liberals want Sydney to be the man, right? Because they can control him, and this is an accommodation, this and all." And I'm, not, I'm not talking about Sydney. I'm talking about the perception, right? Mm -hmm. That that and Sydney was part of the the coup, which was the most probably the most accommodationist of all the the black political organizations. So. Sydney was, was much more acceptable to the white folks. And I think Sydney was the one that they wanted. And so kind of that was kind of the struggle for Dutch running for mayor was not that he was running against Sydney, but that he was running against the idea that wait four more years or wait eight more years and then you can elect Sydney. Much more acceptable guy than than this feisty uh, fighting uh, Dutch Mario. And then you had Tucker. So Sydney and Tucker were both part of the the, the Landry administration, and so, so now, I'm, now I'm in one of these Dutches looking over my shoulder. I can't say everything, but he didn't. He, he didn't like Tucker either. Okay, and Tucker he didn't like Tucker because Tucker was with Moon, and Cindy was with Moon, and they were accommodationists, and, and there were some other things he didn't like about Tucker. I'm not going to say. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn it off for you. <laughs> right. So, so what he did was he said he said to me, "Go out and find me a white liberal." 
I need a white liberal to run council at large. So, so the, to, to, to make, to make Sydney's people spend more money, okay, to make Tucker's people spend more money, to tie him up because he's saying that, that if they get a free reign, if they get a free hand, then it makes it more difficult for me because they're going to be putting money into Tony Morrison and they're going to put money into Kiefer or whatever. So he's thinking strategically. So I went and recruited Woody Koppel to run for council at large to help tie those guys up. And that was, that was, that was, that was, that was a real, that was a real, uh, How can I say this? Um, it was a real, that was a real difficult alliance uh, between Woody and and Dutch. But be that it may, you know, it appealed to, to Woody's ego, and Woody ran. He didn't have a snowball's chance in hell. We knew that, but, <laughs> and he knew that. But you know, he ran because Dutch wanted somebody in there to to to, to make the white liberals spend their money. On, on Sydney and and Tucker, so they couldn't spend it against him. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so he was a strategic. He ran a strategic campaign, uh, and he wasn't just focused on his own race. He was looking at, at all the other races in the city and where uh, and where research research going. We had the least amount of money. We spent the least amount of money. And you know, he, he kept saying, you know, if, if I just had a few more, if I just had a little bit more money, I could get in the runoff. You know, yeah. God damn it, uh, you know. Um, and I, you know, we, we we got by with what we had. I mean, we had, we basically had no money. You know, I I don't even I never saw any of the money. So I, I, I was always a volunteer. Most, I think all of us were volunteers. I don't think anybody was paid in that campaign except maybe the uh, uh, the, the media people. Um, well, obviously in the beginning, um, both blacks and whites um, were pretty convinced that it would be impossible for Dutch to win. I want to know, like, at what point did you guys knew, hey, I have a shot, like, maybe well, we can pull this off? Well, I, the, the, the pundits all thought that, but you know, you couldn't tell Dutch. Yeah. I mean, Dutch, 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 Dutch thought from day one that he was going to win because of his ego. You know, he, you know, there's no way that you could that anybody. I mean, I, and 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 not to say we didn't have doubts. I mean, that there were days when, you know, when things were were uh, dismal and when you know people were kicking our asses so bad that that. Uh, uh, it, but his ego was such that he would never admit that he could lose. I mean, I, th I think, you know, with this court fight, you know, he, was on, he was on a judge in the Court of Appeals. And he probably knew more about constitutional law and law than anybody else. And maybe, and maybe he knew that he would never make it through the other side in this court fight. But as long as he did the court fight, then we'd have a draft Mario. We had a draft Mario committee, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so, so, so it was. It was more of an, you know, having a draft Mario thing made it more of an insurgency, uh, and gave us, you know, a little bit of cover. Uh, I remember. Do y'all have pictures of billboards? The first billboards were kind of psychedelic. They were like blue, pale blue, and and kind of a <coughs> pink color. And the, and and then some hippie guy that I knew that made T-shirts made the first Mario Alpha made T-shirts, and they were kind of day glow, <laughs> day glow kind of T-shirts. Uh, so so you know, have, you know, while he kept, well, you know, as long as long as it was in doubt whether he could do it or not. Uh, you know, he kind of, you know, there, w there was a bit of being under the radar, you know, because people say, well, he could never, you know, he'll never, he'll never give up his judgeship. And then there are always these promises or, or, or rumors that, well, he's going to become a federal judge. You know, he's, the, he's not really interested in being mayor. He's just trying to cut a deal to be a federal judge. That was always circulating. Um, you know, so, so he was convinced from the beginning. And there was no, there was no, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I, 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 I guess, 
I don't, I don't really see any time where I thought that it couldn't happen. Because I was an optimist, you know, I, I, you know about, about black folks and white folks, you know, although realistic about white folks. Who did he want to get into a runoff with? DeRozan. And, and that was kind of, kind of the way, uh, in, in, you know, we try to maximize the black vote, but, we, but, but really, uh, really what, what got us into the runoff, we, uh, it was only 300 and something votes between us and Kiefer, was that white vote. With the with those long hair hippies, was the was the radical that 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 pulled us over, Kiefer, and got us into the into the runoff with DeRosa. Then after that, it was like uh, uh, DeRosa was so unacceptable, and and DeRosa uh, got you know attracted the 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 kind of like a magnet. It wasn't, I mean, I'm not saying it was all DeRosa, but it's kind of like being a magnet. He he attracted the because, well, not when DeRosa, it was Dutch. He, the, DeRosa attracted the, the most bigoted people in the city and outside the city, and they started making uh, unfortunate remarks, and DeRosa made some unfortunate remarks, and things just kind of uh, went downhill for him, and he became, if he wasn't, he was already unacceptable to uh, white liberals, and some of that might happen to do with the fact that he was Italian, I, you know, I don't know. But we wanted DeRosa. Mm -hmm. And they both did, right? Joe's dead? I think so. You know, but Dutch was clearly an intellectually uh, 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 superior to, <laughs> to Joe DeRosa, you know. And, and I, you know, with, with, with Joe, Joe was like talking all this crime and law and order stuff, right? And that was all... That was all racial uh, uh, code words, and and I, you know, I did some research on uh, Joe was on the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and that was kind of just kind of a, I think all the city council people were or something, you know, I, I, you know, wasn't anything really all that serious, but so I went and got the attendance records, showed that he never showed up, right? So then we said, okay, this is the Law and Order man, and we made a commercial out of that. You know, the law and order man never shows up for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then there was some, there was some, I, I remember, I remember a community forum at, on, on Napoleon Avenue at the Catholic, um, Catholic Church. I don't remember the name of it, but, but that was one of those moments where they were at, they had, he, he, where DeRosa had these racist thugs with him out there, and uh, uh, and it offended the the liberal whites. You know, and at, at that point, he you know Dutch got a higher percentage, a much higher percentage of the the black vote, and he was going to get what ninety something percent of the black vote in the end, and you know ten fifteen percent of the white vote. And that was enough to get him over, over the top. But the one we were most afraid of was Kiefer because Kiefer had the most support from the black community because he had the labor union stuff. Uh, I remember one day I was visiting this friend of mine uh, in the Tony Morrison headquarters. I don't know what I was doing. I was on some kind of mission for Dutch, you know. And I walked in, and it was this this this, this beautiful old gingerbread house on 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 uh, Canal Street, it's still there. And I walked in, the guy was like drinking a beer, you know. And I looked at him, and I'm saying, "No way in the world, anybody would walk into Dutch Mario's headquarters." I'm saying this to myself, right? Drinking a beer, sitting around smoking cigarettes, and I just didn't go on. I mean, you know, Dutch it was like business, you know. It's like boom, boom, boom. And um, so the guy, the guy pulls out Matt Kiefer's uh, records from the Mill Institution. <laughs> he shows them to me. And I'm going, this is just, this is like totally, this is like, this is like day and night. You know, if Dutch Mario, if we had such a thing, we wouldn't show it to anybody. We wouldn't talk to anybody about it, and we wouldn't be sitting around drinking beer in the headquarters. It was like a totally different environment uh, from Tony Morrison. And so that was just too loose. 
it was just, a, you know, his campaign was just too loose. Mm -hmm. Ours was just, um, and I wouldn't say regimented, but it was very tight. Uh, it was, uh, uh, especially in the second primary, it became much more compartmentalized. Uh, well, um, who were some of the principal players, strategy, strategists, uh, and his uh, well you advisors. Know, you know what what we what we uh, we, we kind of set up a structure, and in the beginning we set up a structure, and and we tried to make sure that our structure was 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 uh, racially and sexually balanced. That we had black people and white people, uh, and women and men. Uh, Novi Sonyat was one of our, was one of our first people, and uh, she was married to Llewellyn Sonyat. I'm sure you've heard of Llewellyn. And unfortunately, she died right in the middle of the campaign. It was it was one of those, those real sad. It was one of those dismal days, you know, when Novi died. Uh, he had Don Bernard as his as his campaign manager, but, but you know. Don, and I don't mean to be disparaging in any way whatsoever to Don Bernard, but there was no way Don Bernard was the campaign manager. You know, it was Dutch Mario, period. Dutch Mario ran everything, did everything. Uh, but Don, Don wore a suit, and he, you know, he was like the front person for the campaign. Uh, we had, we had a, we had a Dutch Mario for mayor organization on every campus, which is hard to do. I, I've tried to do it, you know, in, in, uh, in other campaigns and been unsuccessful doing it. But we had one here at UNO. We had one at Tulane. And we had a guy, uh, his name is Keith Smith. He works for the, for the school board. He kind of ran our, our campus stuff. Um, Paul Alto was the treasurer. Uh, I, you know, I, I never had anything to do with the money, so I, I you know, Paul was uh, over here. Uh, John Baker was kind of a street street organizer guy. John John was uh, a student at I forget the name of it, university in California. He dropped out, not dropped out. He stayed home to work in the campaign and then never went back. Uh, and he basically runs Paul Valto's office now. Um, uh, well, you know, Carvin was doing the, the media stuff, but we didn't do that much media stuff in the in the in the primary. Uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, the black uh, radio guy. It's something we've talked about. His we have his name. Not Larry McKinley. Yes, yeah. Larry. Larry. Larry McKinley. Yeah. Like whenever I see Larry, he says he comes up. He says Russ Henderson, one of the original felons, still Poe. <laughs> <laughs> From back in the day, Larry was doing stuff with Dutch in the, you know, I don't know. Uh, Maurice McGee, who had just got out of uh, Grambling and political science. Was really a, a, a uh, kind of a foot soldier. Um, I don't have to, you'd have to give me a list. Yeah, we can scan the list later on. Now, once he was in office, got through the election to run off. Right. Did he have the same sort of strategic or methodical approach to city government? I, you know, you know, I, I think his. You know, first, let me say, I did, I, as I said earlier, I didn't work for him, so. I, but you know, if you look at starting with the transition, we had a long transition. Back in those days, I think the election was in, in November, October, November, and then he was sworn in in May. So we had a lot of time. He had a lot of time to think about, it, to think about what he was going to do. Uh, and <clears throat> so I think that was all in a very methodical person. Uh, 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 I think that was done very methodically, uh, and and you know in the way he did things, organized things. He had 
you know, you had things compartmentalized, you had different committees, and it was probably the, the, the most comprehensive transition that we've ever had as mayor, for anybody ever had as mayor, because of his personality and because of the time. Uh, and we've, one of the things that we did after that was did, we did away with that, that long time stretch between election and, and swearing in. Uh, and, um, you know, you started having different actors show up, you know, when, when you were in City Hall. Uh, I, uh, and in 1980, I took a job teaching at Southern which was in Baton Rouge. So I was basically out in the city for two years. He, he had offered me a position right right when I had accepted the position. So I I really didn't want to work for him. I mean, I loved him dearly. And but I, and then when he, when he offered me a position, I, I had already uh, committed to go to work at some. So did you work as an independent advocate, lobbyist, legislative aide? No, I, I taught at Southern for... Well, I, I was working for the Volunteers of America through 1980, I, and I had brought him on the board of the Volunteers of America, and that was part of the, the uh, trans that was part of the transition in the mid 70s to get him in a, uh, in a place where he was dealing with uh, the white power structure in a in a positive way, not just knocking on. Uh, but no, I I um, in '80 I went to work at Southern out there for a couple of years and then I came back and went to work for the school board um, and I never really you know I, I, he and I kind of stayed separate we, we did we did the, the the next campaign we worked on actually I did some judgeship things with him but we did the the, the uh, Jesse Jackson campaign in 84 and I plan and organize that. I, I, you know, if, for the record, I, I'll say I plan and organize Dutch's campaign in '76. I actually, I dared to say that one time at a meeting in front of him, and he didn't say anything. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 so I, I repeat that, you know. Uh, but so, so in 1984, we did the uh, Jesse Jackson campaign, and again, it was kind of a struggle with the uh, uh, the accommodationist who. You know, uh, who um, went to the governor to Edwards and tried to get the governor to call off the the uh, the primary, and then the exchange the governor would appoint all of them to the primary. And we said no, we don't want that. We fought that, so we had we had the primary. It was the only primary that Jesse won, the only state that he won in 1984. And politically, the most important thing for us is the first time since Reconstruction any African American had won a statewide office. So, you know, Dutch was kind of the the, the convener of the the the, organi the people in Baton Rouge and the political organizations there, and the people in you know Shreveport and around the state. And he pulled them together, and um, uh, that was that was a. Uh, a political thing that we did. And then when he died, and he died in 89, at that point, we were having conversations about running for the Senate. Uh, about him running for the Senate, not me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not me running for the Senate. Because we still don't have a statewide elected uh, mm -hmm. black and, and white supremacy is still the organizing principle policy and politics in in Louisiana. You know, when, when he was, when he was, I, th I think he was the best mayor we've ever had. And I think that I, and this is kind of my line. I think he's the best mayor we ever had. I think he's a better mayor than the than the, than the people deserve because they, you know, they, they, especially the white people, they fled instead of staying here and hanging on to, to what was what is a beautiful city. And he, uh, I, you know, I was opposed. I, I'm not opposed. I wasn't into the third term business. You know, I was more like, I, you know, my 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 sense was at that point, you know, we should have been looking at. Senator or governor or something, something else, Congress. Mm -hmm. so at that time, we still had no, no. Uh, wait, let me see. When was when was when was? Uh, yeah, at that time, we still didn't have a black congressperson, and Lenny Boggs was a congressperson. I, I, you know, I would have preferred at that point to look. I, you know, I'm I'm always looking to the next level, kind of like him. And I, th and I, I think that was. Uh, 
I, I think I think being the mayor for eight years and and then running for the, for the third term is just something that that he should I think he shouldn't have done uh, and I think it went against his you know his history being the mm -hmm. first this and the first that and the first this and the first that and I think the 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 um, I think he was pushed by the, the people surrounding him who were more interested in the, in, in, uh, the political stuff, mm -hmm. the patronage stuff, than, than, than pushing him forward to, to go to the next level. Well, what, what do you think was, um, just in general, what do you think motivated him to be involved? He said he was a leader, an organizer. Um, what... Um, what propelled him? Well, I, 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 I think obviously, obviously there was a lot of anger there. You know, there was a lot of anger. Uh, uh, the kind of anger that that, uh, that we still see today in, in people, especially African Americans, who see politics or the business world as, as one big huge affirmative action program for dumb white people. You know, I mean, I, I, I think he, he, he always felt he always thought and always felt that he was, he was just as bright and just as intelligent and just as capable of anybody else, and uh, uh, and I think that drove him. His his own and and his own sense of social justice and commitment to equality. Because you can't ignore, you know, his his uh, his work with the NAACP. And oh, I wasn't part of it in the fifties, uh, other early sixties. You can't ignore his work there. Uh, his his uh, tutorship under Turo, uh, who unfortunately died before he got to see this happen, um, and uh, you know I I, I I really think he he was he, he was until he became mayor I think he was a crusader that he he wanted to change the world and change the change the uh, the environment he wanted to uh, fight the, the devil of white supremacy mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know I, I you know the, the other side of it I mean another side of it was I, that he, he liked the law you know he, he his graduate of LSU in 54 he liked the law he liked being a judge I think he liked being a juvenile court judge and I think he liked being a on the on the court of appeal, and I think he was bright. At, you know, I mean, some of these guys on the court, I'm not going to mention any names, but they they just you know you got to read a lot of stuff up there, you got to absorb a lot of material and stuff, and they're just not into that. And I think he was into it. You know, I mean, he could take he could take things in. Uh, you know, I uh, I think I think that that he 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 always talked about the law as something as a positive. Part of the law, even though he spent a great portion of his life trying to change the law, trying to trying to, to uh, uh, get the constitutional stuff straight. I, I was just thinking about. Um, I'm going to go, and go back to when he was mayor. There, there were some things that went on when he was mayor that um, he and I would battle over, uh, and. One of the things that we battled over was the uh, uh, the World Exposition, 1984. Uh, I had read Robert Moses' uh, book, I mean, Robert Cairo's book about Robert Moses, his, his biography. It was, it was Cairo's first book. And, um, uh, and you know, one of, the, one of, one of Cairo's major one of the things that, 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 that he spent a lot of time with was in the book was describing how the 1965 World's Fair in New York bankrupted the city and how it uh, brought it to its knees and how they had to restructure the whole debt of the city and, mm. and, uh, uh, and it, was just, it was just a financial fiscal disaster. It's called it the power broker. Was the name of it. And uh, 
so I, you know, I, I was really into to Robert, to, to that book and, and, and what it was saying. So I passed it on to Dodge during the, the um, before the, um, everything had fallen into place. And I hate to take responsibility for anything that this, but he's not here, so I can I can I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was a hard bargainer on on the the uh, on the World Exposition. In fact, it was supposed to be a World's Fair, and everybody thinks it was, but it wasn't. It was a World Exposition, and he was a hard bargainer, which really irritated some people, particularly the white uh, uh, financial community. And some of the white political leadership had irritated them that he was such a hard bargainer. But he was a hard bargainer because he didn't want to see the city go down the tubes in the same way that New York City did with the uh, with the World's Fair. And uh, I don't know whether if, if you ever read the book or not. But the way he, but the way he, you know, I gave it to him. If he didn't read it, he he figured it out. You know uh, that that this is what happened there. And, and he took a hard line on the city, the city on denying financial exposure on the part of the city mm -hmm. for the for the world exposition. Yeah. So I think the city pretty much made made it through without you know we had uh, the development of the warehouse district. We had this flim flam kind of show out there, which I I just was never interested in. I you know. You know, and it went on for a couple of years, and then it went away. And I don't think it really had any dire uh, effect on the city. In fact, it had, I think it had a positive effect in the sense that the warehouse district began to become revitalized and renovated and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but he, you know, you have to give him the credit for that—that that he did not allow the city to get sucked into. Because if it, if, if it had gone. Uh, the whole World's Fair route and all this shenanigans, the city would have gone down to tubes at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, I, I, I felt that was a key thing uh, well, it stemmed, in my relationship with him. It seemed to stem from business leaders wanting the, the city to underwrite certain right. aspects of it right. and uh, right. release them of the financial right. obligation. Right. Right. Uh, uh, I'm just kind of skipping around here, so if you want, if you want to make me more focused, just stop me. But well, I just have one final question for you. In your opinion, um, do you think Morial was destined to go first or to be first as mayor, or was at that point pretty much any qualified black candidate could have been the mayor? Oh no! Did he, you know, did he um, make it happen, or was just a, no, the right place, the right thing? It, you know, the, the, the white community was not ready for a black mayor. The liberal, the white liberals were not ready for a white mayor. That they, they wanted an accom accommodationist uh, mayor, and no, he made it happen. You know, this was not. I uh, if if he had not gone, this was you know for me personally, I was I was only uh, twenty nine at the time, and this was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life, and it was just it was just a really Difficult task because of all the obstacles there. You had the the the, uh, the 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 black accommodations who wanted to have their own person. You know the whites, the whites, especially the white. Dutch would say like, you know, uh, uh, the white liberals. They think it's all right for a black person to use the library, but they don't want a black person to run the library. You know. Uh, and you know, I mean that that was in the way. The the you know, if you look at the newspapers, the Picayune was the more racist, reactionary. The the I the, the State Times was the liberal newspaper. Well, you know, neither one of them were. And and the as as Hirsch points out, the Louisiana Weekly supported DeRosa, right? So they all they just went for they just went for the money. Uh, so no, I don't think so. I don't think it would have been. I think it would have been four more years. No, actually eight more years because if Kiefer got elected, mm -hmm. he'd have been there for eight more years. You know, and God knows what. Uh, and, and then you know, man, I guess I guess that the game plan was for Sydney. Uh, I you know, I I, I always I, I was always curious about I was always wondering about how he was going to handle Mardi Gras. Uh, 
uh, Dutch was a, a believer in in people reading, right? He like you know if you could educate people, if you could get them if you get them to read stuff and get them educated, then you could then they would do the right thing, right? And uh, so you know in the in the campaign headquarters we had these big long tables and he had stacks and stacks of material to distribute to people. And he had this this article I think it was from the New Yorker. Uh, it may have been Calvin Trillin, I'm not sure. But in this article that was talking about, uh, you know, we ought to do away with Mardi Gras because Zulu is a, uh, I mean, do, do away with Zulu because it's a, 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 uh, a racist thing and yada yada. You know, and so he was like, you know, we're going to pass this. So no, we're not going to pass that. We're not going to pass out something to the black community that says do away with Zulu. It's just not going to happen. So we didn't do that. But that was kind of his. His, one of his M.O.s was to always be ready to educate people. So I'm, I'm you know, how are we going to handle Mardi Gras? So, of course, the first Mardi Gras, we had police strike, right? And so what the police strike was about was was the was the mafia, which is running the police union, uh, the teams, this Bruno, whoever, they were all mafioso guys, and the, and, and the, the clan people in the union. He had to, he had to take over the police. So, so we had the police strike, and then next year, how you know what's going to happen next year? Well, next year you probably too young to remember this, but, but next year you had Jesse Jackson at on the at Garrier Hall, mm -hmm. right? Dealing, standing there when when Rex was coming by, and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, that's in the all on the Mardi Gras day, right? When when the, he's up there with right. Mario, right. right? Right, right, and that and that and that's and that's he just put Jesse in the in the white establishment's face. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> What's he doing up there? Exactly. <laughs> it was just it was just a mess with him. Uh, and I, I can't remember whether it was that night or whether it was the next year, but it may have been that night. I, I, my my children were small. My oldest son is thirty. 31 now, something like that. Anyway, my children were little babies. So we went we went down to Gallagher Hall, and it was Dutch and I, and my children, and his bodyguard, or bodyguard, may have been two bodyguards. And uh, that was Comus, right? So Comus at Gallagher Hall, everybody's going by then, right? And so basically it's us, and there, there's hardly anybody else in the stands. And these assholes from Comus are coming by and throwing shit as hard as they could at his head. They were trying they were they were literally trying to knock his head off. At Mario? At Mario. Right. Right. because uh, they were so upset at him. You know, this, this is all racial stuff. And so my kids loved it, right? Because <laughs> they were getting all kind of junk, you know? But but literally they were trying to knock his head off. Uh, I can't remember whether that was the same the same day as Jesse or what, but they were, they were not happy with, with him. Um, um, I'll throw out a, a last question. You spoke about <clears throat> you not exactly, you didn't feel comfortable working with him or at least under him mm -hmm. because of your re relationship. Now, how did he deal? Various people have talked about his um, apparent aloofness or arrogance. Mm -hmm. How did that translate into his dealings in city government? How do you think he uh, was able to negotiate compromise? Well, so I, ne I never did like the arrogant part because you know, I, 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 I no, I never did like the word arrogant being used to describe him because it, it, you know, it, look, he's a he was a bright, intelligent, capable black man. So you're gonna call him arrogant, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, that that was that was what the the white racist press called it, and. You know, he, 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 politically, you know, I, it's hard, you know, in retrospect, it's hard to see how he could avoid what happened, you know, it, it, when he ran for re-election. I mean, they, they all jumped on him and, and, uh, and he ended up having a re-election, which really made him angry, right? Made him angrier than ever. Why should I have a re-election, you know? I'm the brightest, most capable guy in the city and all. Why would these people be running against me? And uh, and, it, and that just soured his relationships with the city council 
and the press and everybody, you know, in the white power elite, even further. Uh, and that was when when uh, Fauche ran against him, mm -hmm. and Bill Jefferson. Right. Bill Jefferson was an early supporter. Bill Jefferson was a supporter in the second primary. <laughs> okay. The Democratic, the Democratic, and Bill Jefferson was closer to the Democratic Party establishment. He had been working for Bennett. The, the Democratic Party establishment, Gillis Long, uh, Edwards, none of those people, not one of them helped Dutch running for mayor the first time. In fact, they all helped somebody else. They all helped Kiefer, or they all helped uh, uh, Tony Morrison. Morrison. Uh, none of them. You know, none of the party establishment was with, with Dutch. So, so when, when Jeff ran, it was kind of like Jeff was running from the left and, 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 and Fauche was running from the right, and it was, it was a fairly close election. I didn't think he was going to lose, but it was a fairly close election. And I'm sure, well, I know he was not happy about having to do that, having to go through that. felt like he, didn't ha he shouldn't have, have had to go through that because mm -hmm. he was an excellent mayor. He was running the city better than anybody else. And if you look at, if you look at the, you know, if you look at, if you, if on the whole, look at, on the whole, look at his administration and look at the people that were the caliber of the people that, you know, I may not have agreed policy-wise with everybody in the administration, but on the whole, he had some really great people working in that administration um, uh, that were uh, idealists, uh, that were thinkers, that were, uh, you know, I mean, he had his duds too. But in general, <laughs> in general, and 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 and, all, and nearly, for the most part, corruption free. I mean, I can't, I, I don't, I can't, I can only think of one indictment during the whole thing, and it really was a BS thing, and it happened at the end. You know, something with Harry Connick was pissed off at at, at Dutch. You know. Uh, but uh, I mean, can y'all? I can't think of any, 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 uh, any, any indictment, any investigation, any, uh, you know. Although the, the, you know, the white racists were always uh, raising the flag about corruption and stuff in city hall or whatever. I can't remember any of that. It was relatively scandal free. Yeah, right. Um, right. Now his, you mentioned earlier the. Uh, we have the two minutes but on this tape. I can okay. You mentioned the uh, sort of relationship he had with Sidney Bartholomew. Sidney Bartholomew later became uh -huh. uh, councilman at large. Mm -hmm. Lambert Boissier, who was right. also a right. colleague of. Um, right. So, how did this sort of relationship? Well, the f one of the first one of the first things that he did, and I and I, I did not, I, I can't say I. One of the first things he, he did was he went and had had them all arrested. <laughs> you know, yeah. they had some kind of reading program out in the in Gentilly. And they were like, you know, the, the wives and family of the of the coup people. He went and had them all arrested. With, I don't know, it's right after he got elected. It's like the Sita thing, isn't it? It was one of those Sita things, right? Had them all arrested. Um, and you know, they would never, nothing ever happened to. Them. But you know, they sent the media out, and it was like, you know, it's a big brouhaha. Then politically, you know, electoral politics. Then he took on uh, Henry Braden. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Anyway, uh, anyway, Don Hubbard. No, no, no. The, the coup, the, the the coup elected people. There was a, oh. there was a state representative guy who was a principal at uh, uh, at Saint Aug. Uh, Arthur Morell uh, beat him, uh, but he, you know, he, he he went to war with with them. And I, you know, this whole thing with the Bradens and the Marios. I mean, we would we would like th during the election. Do, do you have time for this one? Uh -huh. <laughs> in 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 in, in uh, uh, seventy six when he was running, you know, like we we'd go to uh, uh, this this oyster place on on Claiborne. I can't remember the name of it. It's not open anymore. But you know, we'd get there and we'd order our oysters, and he and he he'd, he'd be talking to us. Says, well, when was when was Henry here? When was Henry here? And Henry was here yesterday. Arr! You know, and. <laughs> You know, it was one of these these things that went back generations, and who knows, who knows, like the Hatfield and McCoys, who knows what started the Mario Braden feud. But, and and I never could, I, personally, I never could get into the feud because I said I wasn't about that. You know, and I'm not, and I'm not putting him down for being in it, but it was some some kind of interpersonal thing that I didn't understand.
some kind of seven of war thing that I didn't understand. So, so he took them out. Politically, he took them out. He took out Henry Braden, and he took out the principal of the, and there was one other one I can't remember. Uh, and I, I thought it was unnecessary. I, I, you know, I mean, these guys were starting the legislature. I, you know, I thought Henry Braden was, you know, voted pretty well, and, and the Rev voted pretty well. I'm into policy stuff. I didn't see the need to go out <laughs> and wipe them out. You know, but I think that was kind of a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge. I'm going to put my people in. That's how, how uh, Bag Dennis Bagner got to be the senator. Because uh, he beat Henry Braden. So, you know, that, that kind of inner Nicene political warfare. And he was always fighting with Sherman. Mm. Uh, and... You know, it's kind of ironic, one of life's ironies that when Dutch died, like that day, Sherman's like on the phone, you know, uh, at the funeral, you know, working out so that Sherman could be the, the Democratic National Committee person to take Dutch's place, uh, which I didn't particularly appreciate. <laughs> yeah, do it. Okay, I think we need to wrap this one up, and then thank you for your time, All right. and um, maybe we can get, get with you again. It was fun. I hope I didn't insult too many people. <laughs> you know, he always operated on a need-to-know basis, you know, and he was very, very careful about what you said, how you said, who you spoke to, and all that kind of stuff. So, so I'm like thinking, you know, mm -hmm. ah, what would he want me to say? What would he not want me to say in this, in this kind of circumstance? You, know? you ready? Okay, Avery, Avery Alexander was uh, mixed up in that uh, uh, assessors race in in Central City that I spoke about earlier. That you know, it was they they wanted Dutch to come in, and he, you know, I, I'm not going to. Sometimes sometimes Dutch would use the N word, and I and I just I'd have to stop it. I mean, I, I'm, I, it was just the way I I was brought up, right? And, and you know, maybe it's not today, but that he would he'd be talking about you know the the big mess in. The, Central City area, and how they were trying to bring him in to straighten it out. But I don't think he really wanted to straighten it out. I think he wanted as many African Americans running for, for that assessment because that would bring up the turnout in the election. Earl was <coughs> Earl was a, the godfather of, of black politics in Louisiana. He ran for office in the in the fifties. He may have even run for mayor. I mean, for governor. I'm not sure what he ran for. I think in Faircloth he talks a little bit about. It. Earl. Earl's the only person that, that that I know that told me, you know, the time and the place where he, he went crazy, and that had to do with his, his his best friend dying in Cherry Hospital in his arms in 1968, and it was downhill for, for Earl from then on out. Uh, Earl used to call me a columnist. <laughs> in fact, one of the newspapers, I can't remember whether it was the Figaro or Courier or whatever, said that the uh, you know, I think it was during the, the, the runoff said the prospect of Earl Amity and Russell Henderson serving in the Mario administration strikes fear in the hearts of uptown liberals, something like whites, uptown whites, uh, white people, I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. Earl, Earl was like such a pioneer. He was like, uh, 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 he did, he did uh, death, death penalty uh, litigation. Uh, and uh, it was just a real tragedy that he, he ended up almost a street person at the end, at the end of his life because he was such a um, he was such a brilliant man. Even when he was crazy, he was brilliant. Hmm. Uh, and he was the, the the law firm, the the Valto, Marial, uh, Gertie's, whatever the right name, the law firm. They kind of kept him alive. Mm. And he was in and out of, of um, the uh, Peter Claver building. Now the Peter Claver building was on Arlene's, next to where this new Peter Claver building is, and it was a fine old building. I, I, I think it was a French hospital or something, and it was one of the. It should never have been torn down uh, uh, because it's a historic. It, with the NAACP met in there, that's where Dutch ran the whole campaign uh, for, for mayor out of, and, and it's just a historic black building, but that's the kind of buildings that we tear down. So now it's an empty, uh, empty uh, lot. Uh, Do you know anything about Sidney Bach? 
Not very much. You know, I, I know that I know that Sydney when when, when <clears throat> this was on the the the, uh, the uh, litigation to to uh, be able to run right as a judge. Right. I think that was. What I, I think he may have handled handled that, but I know um, there was a board of liquidation desegregate that because it was a self perpetuating board. Yeah. That, I know. Dutch, Dutch, Dutch liked to talk about the border liquidation, and frankly, I didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand. But he liked to talk about the border liquidation as, as one of the, the things that he wanted to change, and that was one of the reasons why they didn't want him to become mayor, because he was going to change that border liquidation and make it more representative of the people in New Orleans. Michael was like my Michael Bagneris was like my age. I don't really know what he did in the campaign. He became. Um, City attorney, right? City attorney. No, no, that was Sal Anselmo. Uh, anyway, he, he went to work in the, you know, in the administration. Now, Michael had a falling out with the siblings. Michael was supporting Mets for mayor. Uh, I don't know where Diana Bagewell was in the election, but she was a sole person, so I, I kind of doubt that she was with Dutch. <clears throat> John Henry Baker. John Henry Baker was a college student uh, who uh, went to college somewhere in California and, 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 and stayed in New Orleans to work in the campaign. I don't think he ever finished that college. I, think, I mean, he did finish finish college at Loyola, I think, but. You know, it took him a long time to do it because he's, he he worked um, in the campaign as a uh, as kind of a street organizer, kind of ran the office, and uh, now he works with Paul Balto. He's one of the straight straight arrows, one of the most hardworking, competent people that I've ever known in my life. Um, and that's John Henry. Philip is it, Philip is somebody to interview if you want. Uh, stories about uh, Dutch before all of this because he's probably alive now. He's probably out of all the people alive now, he's probably the person that's known Dutch more long than anybody else. You kind of have to get Philip to stop talking about himself. You know, I mean, I, we all like to talk about ourselves. But if you can kind of get him to talk about Dutch instead of Philip, because he's going to tell you he was the first this and first that too. Uh, let's see what we talked about. Don Bernard was a campaign manager, but that was in name only, and I don't mean to be disparaging about Don, but you know, there's nobody going to run Dutch's campaigns but Dutch. And uh, Don made a good uh, uh, front person, he wore a suit. Uh, and uh, I th in, fact, in fact, if I remember right, one of these, the Times Picayune, uh, or one of these these rags gave him put him in the ten best dress in the world, which is which is what Dutch had him up there for, you know, just to, to front for it. Uh, and Don later became the secretary of the Department of Commerce in the Trina administration, as uh, when Louis Lambert supported Dutch for mayor. And then when Lewis ran for governor in 1980, I think, uh, Dutch supported Fitzmaurice. Because Dutch was always trying to reach out to white people. You know, I, I, to, to me, a kind of a futile gesture to, to try and bring in, you know, the racist white people. And, I, you know, I'm out, I, today I still think that we should be having, I mean, today, even more today, I think that we should we should be having more communication with white people about him and white supremacy and what it's all about. But I, th I, I think he, you know, he, instead of saying, okay, this is the circle of white progressives and we're going to try and go to the next beyond, he was trying to get to like Lakefront and those people and it was hopeless. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I just, I, I think politically that was a mistake to, to, kind of leave your core and go so far out because they were never going to buy into him. And then, you know, they didn't buy into him. This, this happened. This was part of, um, this part, part of his second term strategy. He's going to go with, with Fitzmaurice and 
then that's going to help him with the, you know, when he runs for real, it didn't help him. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and, uh, and then Train got elected, and when it was between Train and Lambert, Dutch didn't take a position. So you can fill in the blanks on that one. I, 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 Don gets to be the, the commissioner of uh, com the Commerce Commission, the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, Harriet ran the campaign office. She was Harriet Burnett. Yes, yeah, she ran the office. Uh, Herbert was part of the law firm with Gertie's, Valto, and Kay, which was the Morel law firm. Uh, Raphael. Uh, I'm ashamed to say I can't remember what Raphael did in the campaign, but I'm sure he did. I, I, I think, you know, Dutch liked to, to surround himself with intellectuals. And, and you know, thinking people, and and, and, mm -hmm. and and he would seek advice from them, and I think Raphael would have been part of that. Uh, I know he later said on the VCC, um, yeah, but I don't think he really had anything to do with the administration. No, but I, I think he probably, I think Raphael's probably one of those brain trust guys that he talked to, you know, and you know when he was running and ideas and stuff, because Raphael was from a different part of the city. Raphael was from the Ninth Ward. Raphael was, was, excuse me, but Raphael was black, black, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, you know he needed he needed the intellectual Dutch needed and wanted the intellectual support of somebody like Raphael. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, Louis Charbonnet. Uh, let's see. It, it, I'm not sure about Mark and Jacques falling out with him, but I know that Lewis fell out with the AFL-CIO, and Lewis was 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 cutting was trying to cut a deal with the trains, and uh, and that was the end of him politically. Uh, yeah, yeah. Miss Chase was was absolutely uh, 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 loved uh, Dutch Mario. Still loves Dutch Mario. Uh, <coughs> we would have. Uh, we, we sometimes we would have meetings there at her place. Uh, I uh, I have a she fixes green gumbo once a year uh, on on Holy Thursday and gumbo's there. And so I I, I always have a bunch of disparate people. You know, trying to get people from all walks of life who don't know each other. And. Uh, I invited him a couple of times, and he showed up one time. And I, th I think some. I think it must have been like second, third year, and I think he went in his closet and cleared out the wine bottles that people had given him. Put them in swaggy bags. He brought them to this Chase's restaurant. And they, it was the only person that would dare to bring wine bottles and swaggy's bag to, to Miss Chase's restaurant. This Dutch Marion. She's probably uh, he's probably the only one that she would allow to do such a thing. I haven't seen Alan in a while. I don't. I don't remember what he did. Campaign. I know he went to work in the administration, in the housing office. Um, Harry Connick Sr. Well, Dutch had a, a um, uh, off and on kind of relationship with him, and kind of when he went off with him was when 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 uh, Mars ran for. Uh, district attorney in 1984, and uh, I was pushing for the, you know, for the. Harry's going to come back and get me. But anyway, I was I was on the I was with the youngsters. I was with with, with, with Mark and Jock and those guys pushing for Morris. Morris had become the head of OMI, uh, uh, and uh, in fact, when we had, I remember sitting in the mayor's in Dutch's office. And uh, this was kind of a political meeting. It wasn't a, you know, who's for, who's for Harry Connick? And everybody raised their hand except for me. Who's for Mara Street? I'm the only one to raise my hand. And uh, uh, so um, it ended up being, it ended up being a, uh, It ended up being a dual endorsement, a split endorsement, and that was the beginning of the, the, the 
I, I, you know, that was when Dutch and Harry began having their fall out. It was when Dutch went for the duel with Doris Mars. And Mars was a political disaster after that. But um, that race for, for the uh, district attorney in 84 was one of the greatest races I've ever been involved in. I played and organized that one too. And we almost won. We had no money. Mm -hmm. But that was that was fun. But Mars we went down after that. Um, but that was, uh, and and then it, I think that that the whole thing at the end of the yes. You might need to move your cell phone. It's getting a buzz. I'm sorry. Maybe just put it on that table back there. There we go. Oh, that's good. Thanks. And I think that uh, well, uh, as far as I know, that was like the beginning of the end of the relationship between Harry and. Mm -hmm. was the uh, Mars Rita. and at the end of the at the end of the at the end of the Mars administration in the middle of trying to get the third term Harry indicted uh, a couple of people in the administration um, and one of them copped copped the uh, uh, it's a plea bargain yeah, misdemeanor stuff. I mean, it was, it was like, it was just one of those little, uh, you know, who's who's on top? I'm, you know, I'm the DA and I can mess with you when I want to, mm. kind of a thing. Um, but their their relationship had deteriorated by then. Mike early. Mike Mike and Dutch just never got on, and I, you know, I, 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 you know, I like, I like Mike, and I like Dutch, and I always wanted to see them get on, but they never, they never could get on. Uh, Ron Fauci was kind of the great white hope, you know, to to come back in and defeat uh, Dutch uh, in the second term uh, with with Jeff running from the left and and Fauci running from the right, uh, and they didn't. They didn't beat him, but it it uh, it was a very uh, nasty, hard election, and it kind of hardened Dutch uh, because Dutch thought that he should have been reelected without all of this because he was the best mayor the city ever had, and and he was the best mayor, from my opinion, the best mm -hmm. mayor the city ever had. And but this is America; and everybody can run for things, but you know, it just shouldn't. Have it shouldn't have gone down that way. Norman Francis was always um, there. I think I think Norman's uh, son was Mark's best friend, and uh, so Mark, Norman was somewhere around all I, the time. I see he's retiring or stepping down. I don't know anything about that. I think I saw it in the paper the other day. You th you thinking about the president of Dillard? Dillard, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, my president. I Lomax. Lomax. I teach at Dillard. Um, uh, 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 James Galata was is retired now. He was a judge on the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, and he is somebody that you could talk to about Dutch on the first on the Fourth Circuit. They were good friends. Uh, 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 you know, I remember in those days talking to to, to Judge Galata and Dutch together often, and he's still alive. I see him at the legislature every once in a while. Uh, uh, Carl Galvin, he was he was one of the the, the black uh, uh, militant guys that uh, <clears throat> that Dutch went to uh, uh, you know when he couldn't go to the political organizations and he helped out and then they had a falling out shortly thereafter after after Dutch got elected. It was about Insurance contracts, I think. Ron Gardner, no comment. Uh, Gertie's was the uh, Gertie's was the uh, uh, Gertie's Valto, the law firm, uh, the Dutch law firm. Joe Gibbons was a community is a community organizer today. Uh, he was one of the guys that was on on one of the uh, the aircraft carriers in the Vietnam War that that. Uh, they had a protest on the aircraft carrier. Now he, he, he runs this church-based community organization in New Orleans. I can't remember the name of it. But he, uh, he was a field, he worked in 
as a grassroots guy with, with Dutch, and then he went to work in the housing department. Uh, and since then, you know, he's, he's, he's gone off to the Pacifica Institute and, and, and gotten more training as a community organizer. Mm -hmm. and Is it all congregations yes, together? Yes, yes. Right, yeah, he's the director of ACT. Uh, Gus, I, I, you know, I, I remember during the campaign, <coughs> back and forth between Gus and, and Dutch and letters and telephone calls, and, but he never did, uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, Gus, Gus was a candidate for governor, I don't remember that. He was the attorney general during the election. Mm -hmm. uh, that's me. Skip uh, Don Hubbard, during, during the campaign at, at the, uh, in the runoff, when it was clear in the runoff that we were going to get 90 to 100 percent of the black vote, especially running against DeRosa, and, and we had already we had already shown that we had gotten as far as we got without the black political organizations, and that we, we were not going to win uh, or lose. I mean, it might have helped out a little bit with with uh, uh, turnout, and, and Dutch kept calling prostitutes, and you know, he, you know, he, he had no respect for them. And uh, so, uh, so what he did is he gave them like phones, and titles, and, you know, and basically said, you know, okay, I'm gonna do something, you know, and uh, kept them out away from away from the headquarters, and you know, made them feel important, I guess. Uh, remember Mario's team. You know, in the legal, the legal thing. At some point, he was he was involved, right? Uh, yeah, Larry, Larry was another one of those. Uh, at that at that point, Larry was a radical. Larry Jones. Yeah, he was a radical, and uh, then he went off and got an MBA. <laughs> 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 but, uh, maybe one, one of the things that, that Dutch did to stick it to the to the white establishment was to point it to uh, Audubon. <laughs> Audubon Park Commission. I think so. But, and, and he did that just to. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he had other motivations, but in large part, just to stick it to him, because Larry was a radical in those days. And not anymore. Lester, what is this? The wonderful I asked what kind of No, oh, it's a it's a flyer I found it. Um uh Tulane. Which I, I have a I have a flyer. Uh, but on, on election day on election day I was at, at a bridge in the, the, the right next to the Zyre Project. I don't know what street, Louisa or whatever. And somebody flew over in a helicopter. You know, I, I think I know who it was, and I think who did it, but they flew over in a helicopter dropping all these leaflets. And they had, they had one with, uh, 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 one leaflet had Nat Kiefer uh, humping a tree. Okay? It was, you know, it was, it was the portrayal of Nat Kiefer is the crazy man. And then, and then another one had, um, DeRosa with a violin case, right? Because this mafia guy with violin, the, and the dollar bills are falling out the violin case, and Marl is picking them up, and you know, and the 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 caption was something like, you know, why is DeRosa giving money to? And now there was nothing about Tony Morrison, so this probably was the Tony Morrison flyover. Felicia, Felicia, and I don't, I don't really want to talk about Felicia, but Felicia was one of those people that was with Sydney, in a white liberal uptown that Dutch uh, had to deal with. I don't know anything about fundraisers from Mario. So you're saying basically she would have supported, this is one, she and the maneuvering. She wasn't part of it. She wasn't part of it. 
he would have he, he associated her with Sydney and Newton and all those guys. And I'm gonna leave it at that. Mm. Uh, Nat. Oh God, Nat was such a problematic figure. And uh, I don't know his, po his problems were documented by the media. Uh, he had a hot temper. He was, he, was, uh, he was kind of a wild man. Uh, and he was the one that was supported by the, uh, uh, the AFL-CIO, by, by Victor Busey and the establishment AFL-CIO. And, uh, and the black political organizations, the, the accommodations ones. So. Mm -hmm. I think who eventually endorsed Morial, and it may have been, only been for the second term. I think, oh yeah, but they all did Morial the second term. Um, but they, uh, the keeper was probably, the keeper was the one that we had to beat in the first primary mm -hmm. in order to win the election. If we had not, if we, had, if we ended up in a runoff with Kiefer, it would have been much more difficult. Um, Eddie Kurtz. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ed, Eddie was always a target of, of Dutch uh, rhetoric. Uh, he was going to shake up safety and permits. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, and this is the father. This is not the. You probably don't know Eddie. Eddie's a filmmaker. Uh, the uh, the guy who's my age. Mm -hmm. So it's not that guy, it's his father. And there was another one, I can't remember, but I just love to talk about him. Um, uh, David Marcello. Um, David was executive counsel and he wanted to be city attorney. He didn't have enough experience, he didn't have enough years or something, he couldn't be. And then something happened with, with the city council and David got in trouble with the city council and then Dutch basically uh, created a position for him somewhere at Loyola or something, hmm. a sinecure. And I guess he fired him, but you know, he didn't fire him. I don't know what it was about, but I, I was there. I remember. I remember. I was in. I was in the city council when it happened. When he made this statement, whatever it was he made, and uh, but I don't remember what it was about. Uh, Larry McKinley mentioned earlier that he was one of the original followers of Steel Pope. Uh, Herman Matoya. Was, was Duchess Cryer in juvenile court? And I mentioned him earlier that when I, when I hang out with Duchess Juvenile, he was his Cryer. He's still alive. Mary Moore was Duchess secretary. Uh, I, I tell you my Tony Montfort. I mean my Tony Morrison story. I'm gonna skip Tony Montfort. Rebus Parsons. We're supposed to be interviewing Tony Mumphrey sometime soon. Carrie's mm -hmm. dead. Carrie was younger than me. And he went to work for a lot. He went to work for, for Jeff at some point, and then he died about 10 years ago. He was, well, it says right here, he's the first LSU president of the board, student body, first black president of the student body at LSU. <coughs> and, uh, God, he must have, he must have been in his late thirties when he died. He was a very bright guy from up from New Roads or someplace like that. Uh, he was probably probably second primary. Hmm. Uh, uh, Ed Renwick, uh, one of my favorite uh, all time political stories, which I love to tell, was <laughs> we were at. We're at uh, Jack Davis's wedding. Jack was a, a 
an assistant editor or something at the Times Picayune. I don't know where he is now. He may be an editor of the Chicago Tribune. He's a big timer somewhere. And the wedding was at Gallagher Hall, and uh, Dutch Dutch was the uh, Dutch was the, the, the he was a judge, so he he was the what do you call it? He wasn't a priest. <laughs> he presided over the wedding, uh -huh. whatever. Married him. It's a big wedding. And my book was there, and uh, you know, and I didn't really know him, but I got into this conversation with him about the election, and he said, and it's almost a direct quote: "No way, Dutch Martin will ever get elected mayor of New Orleans." And I said, "Wow!" I said, "You know, I said, I miss the Dr. Renwick. Um, I'm out there with Dutch, and I'm talking to people, and I'm seeing how people respond to him, and it's just, just." Um, um, you know, I can I can sense it, I can feel it that people are going to vote for him. But Renwick was was uh, on some some somebody else's payroll who didn't even came in like seventh or eighth or something. I don't know. One one of the top five. Uh, but that was my, one of my favorite moments was telling Renwick, which I'm sure he doesn't remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dutch was going to win. Uh, Alan Robinson uh, when. Uh, Allen was really important because uh, you know, and getting white votes, right? You know, we had to get. Allen was gay. I think Allen is still alive. Allen used to have a bookstore, Marini bookstore, on the corner of of Marini and uh, and Charters. And I haven't seen him recently, but. Allen was was a key person in the in the Marnell campaign because he was gay. And um, this is the same fellow who ran uh, as a delegate for um, the uh, candidate from Oklahoma, um, Fred, Fred, Fred Fred Harris. Fred Harris. He may he may have been a, he may have been one of my Fred Harris people. Okay. I'm not sure. But Alan, Alan was kind of a, a gay political leader at that point. He was young. Uh, we didn't have lag pack. We had what called Gertrude uh, Gertrude Stein Salons or something like that. <laughs> I think they called them. Uh, and uh, so Alan was a key person. And, and when 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 Dutch got elected, he put Alan on the the police. Uh, Selection, police or tennis selection thing. But D Dutch's relationship with the gay community was really important. You know, we're talking about small numbers here, right? We're not talking about tens of thousands of people. We're talking about look at trying to get enough votes to beat Matt Keeper. And uh, there was a there was a big rally in um, in the um, at Jackson Square. Uh, and I, I, I don't remember what it, whether it was for what's the name of that woman, the singer, um, the homophobic singer. Oh, uh, Anita Bryant. I don't know whether it was an anti-Anita Bryant oh. thing or, or what it was, but it was a big rally at Jackson Square, <coughs> and so I, I put a Dutch. I put on my blue and and and. Uh, My blue and orange Dutch Mario T-shirt, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> My hippie T-shirt, and uh, went out. And he gave me like this carefully crafted 25-word statement: Dutch Mario is for human rights for everybody. Da da da. And I made that statement in front of this crowd. And um, and you know the point was to get gay voters. You know mm -hmm. it was it wasn't Dutch reaching out to gay voters, but he did send me out. I don't know beard and long hair and all, but anyway, uh, we, we were talking about in 76, mm -hmm. you know, 77, uh, and so, you know, the, the gays were very important, even though they were not organized, politically they were not organized, and before lag pack, but the gays were an important small piece in putting together that, that coalition uh, to uh, win. Uh, it's like there were gay, there were there were gays in other people's candidate campaigns. Uh, 
Uh, I never really dealt with Reynard Roshan. Uh, I don't know Martha Rose, Alice Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig supported Mario. I don't know about that. Not say he did. Uh, Ricker, man, he 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 just Dutch always talk about Ricker. He never, you know, it was one of those things, like, it was something, probably something that happened in the past that I never heard what it was, but he was, he loved to talk about him. <laughs> and it was nothing, it was nothing pretty. Uh, Schultz, Milton Steyer, S-T-I-R-E, this is a show. Mary, Mary, Mary Ethel Seekin, Operations Coordinator. She was good. Uh, Llewellyn, that's no Novice's husband, remember? Okay. Now, I, now, I don't think Novice was going to manage the campaign. I don't, I don't think that was what was going on. But we had a, we had a, we had a, uh, uh, a steering committee, a full person, and I don't remember who else was on it. But we had like a four, four or six persons there that was racially, sexually mixed. Mm -hmm. And Novice was the black woman on that steering committee. And that was kind of like Dutch and I sat down and draw and drew up a little, uh, what's the right word, what are we looking for? But anyway, we drew up a little chart, <laughs> you know, black, white, male, female, mm -hmm. and, and put people in those spots. Uh, ben C. Colliano, he's still alive, right? I think he is. I, think he's in, I don't know what to say about that. I'm, 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 I'm Returning, right? Yeah. Uh, I was with I was with um, this was like in 79 79 I was at somebody's house well, it was Jack Weiss or Jack Davis I think it was Jack Davis's house I'm not sure and and Toledano was there it was just the three of us and um, Sam, I'm, I'm not my, my childhood um, Anyway, Toledano was like ranting and raving about the problem with with uh, Moon Lander is that he's an in lover. The problem with Dutch Mario is he's an in. The problem with the city of New Orleans is it's full of ins. It's just in, in, in. And it's like you know I'm going, and and he's talking about running for mayor. And I, you know, finally I said, Mr. I said, Mr. Toledano, I said, I, I just. I don't understand why you would want to be the mayor of a city that you hold in such low esteem. What's the point? And I, I think he, I think he knew that I was like, you know, who I was, and I think he was just trying to get a, a rise out of me, you know. Uh, and then, and then, Reagan was going to appoint him to the federal courts, and so Dutch and I started this campaign to stop that from happening. And I said, told him I was going to come back and haunt me. But, uh, but we stopped it. Hmm. Uh, what year was this? Uh, Reagan was the president. Dutch was the mayor. So some, sometime between 80 and 86. Whenever, whenever, whenever he tried to appoint Toledano to the mm -hmm. court of appeals. And, it, and, and I, you know, I'm not saying that it, it came from that conversation I had. Because obviously when you talk like that, you don't just talk like that one time. You talk like that all the time or whatever. So we like did a campaign to stop him. Uh, Council uh, Lawrence candidate a life ticket? I don't think so. Dutch Dutch uh, was opposed to Bob Tucker. He was not a friend of Bob Tucker's. He didn't like Bob Tucker. Um, he saw Bob Tucker as a as a tool of the uh, of the Landry people. Uh, and if he was on the ticket, God, I don't remember that. Because remember, I was telling you earlier about about uh, how getting Woody Cop to run. It was against uh, Tucker and um, Bartholomew. And Bartholomew. Yeah. Now Paul Valto was was the um, was the finance chair. I, I, Campaign communication director. I don't know about that, but he was the, the finance chair, <clears throat> and he got to be the the civil 
civil sheriff. And Ben Young was always there as the reporter for the weekly covering the campaign. Didn't he change his name? I don't know. I think he became a Muslim. Warren Woodfell, I don't know. Undercover 1977 campaign. I don't know. Woodfark? Is that, is that Woodfark? I'm not familiar with this guy. I mean, we get names from all, all over, I except for some of you all bring him in. I think that must be what Yeah, the chief of police. Right. Yeah. Right. What, what would his last name be? Woodfork. W-W-O-D-F-O-R-K. Chief of police? Yeah. Eventually, yeah. I don't think it wasn't back then. No, no, at the end, at the end of the Marlowe administration. Right. After Parsons. Yeah, I remember. I remember when uh, you know that that's always on the police, and uh, <coughs> and he must have put out some kind of order that said that you can't hang out at the donut shops. Okay, they, they they just they stopped hanging out, and I think he probably did. He probably issued some kind of order saying you can't show. So when Cindy got elected and they appointed Cindy's first chief. Uh, arrest Anesta? Was it Anesta Taylor? I forget. But anyway, whoever, whoever the city's first chief of police uh, that he appointed, and this is a true story, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, Tasty Donuts at Broad and Esplanade, they must have had 100 police cars there <laughs> that day. The memo went out that the you can now return to Now you can go back to the donut shop. shop. <laughs> 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 they were all at the donut shop, you know. Well, hey, man, I appreciate well, thank you. this this little land yap. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the whole thing. Thank you very much. Okay.